Well, today we look across to the Irish Times to see, once again, what their view of Brexit and this whole fiasco it is. I always reiterate numerous times that it's really important to go and have a look at how Brexit is covered in foreign uh, press and newspapers because you get a different opinion. You also get more facts than you probably would than our British papers might be intended to print. And you also get different opinions. And today we're going to go over one from Flynn, uh, Flynn, Flynn, uh, Flynn McGredmond. And I, I do think he's got a very good point to make here. And once again, this leads into the whole idea of Britain being uh, superior and this, once again, this idea of, of the British Empire and again, how superior, quote, we are as British, even though we're not. It's this massive myth that we have uh, conned, our, um, many people have conned themselves into thinking. So, Britain is uncomfortable because Ireland has the upper hand for the first time. The UK made its position abundantly clear. It wants nothing to do with the European Union, its institutions, rules, bureaucracy and politicians. Thankfully, after Boris Johnson secured a, a seismic mandate from the electorate late last year, the UK has left the EU and needn't worry itself anymore. Given that British commentators remain curiously obsessed with the European Union's internal politics, even when it has no impact on the United Kingdom at all, the latest in, the latest in this saga is the delight certain Brexit ideologues took on the out on the out on the sorry, on the ongoing EU budget negotiations, which saw Ireland asked to increase its monetary contributions while cutting subsidies for Irish farmers and regional development programmes. Ross Clark wrote in the Spectator that the uh, oh sorry, we're just gonna say Leo Varadkar rather than the, the name for the Irish Prime Minister because I always butcher it. <laughs> Leo Varadkar was hung out to dry by the EU while Brexit commentator Darren Grimes revealed, uh, seemed to revel in the notion that Varadkar's slavish loyalty to the EU had seen, had seen a pretty poor return on the investment. Varadkar and the Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs Minister Simon Covery have long been dismissed by parts of the UK press as mere patsies for the European Union, happy to be weaponised by the shadowy figures in, um, in, uh, in, Bla in, Bla in, Bla in Blaumont, only to be thrown under the under the bus later. The latest budget news has made for some very happy Brexiteers indeed. They think they've been proven right, and with their oh, and with their uh, press to continue their ill-informed criticisms of the Irish government has been renewed. These dismissals of Varadkar and Covery uh, as foolish cronies of Michelle Barnier and John Claude Juncker are just part of a much wider pattern. It seems the notion of Ireland as a country with its own interests, capable of working on its own advantage, um, to many in the UK government and its friends in the UK press, from the Telegraph to the Spectator to the Express, is just not inconceivable, but a straightforward impossibility. Instead, they view Ireland's steadfast commitment to maintaining an open border as a product of Brussels manipulation, something that the nasty technocrats on the continent are using to leverage to punish the UK for, de uh, for, de for deciding to leave the bloc. This laughably self-obsessed belief is replicated to, and the UK's commentarian's mistaken view that Varadkar has uh, suffered in the election because of his stance on Brexit. And it shows exactly what type of government currently occupies Number 10 Downing Street. One that is incapable of viewing Ireland and the European Union through any other, um, through any other lens than itself. So the fight for an open border is not seen as a bid to protect the stability and security of a highly, of a highly um, free, freeable region. It, also, it, uh, it only rec uh, recently... Um, only recently at peace and still awaiting true reconciliation, but rather as a bid from the petulant EU to make life from the Conservatives as hard as possible. And the ongoing budget negotiation between the EU and Ireland are not understood as the standard issue budget negotiations often are, but rather as Ireland receiving its just desserts for refusing to cow to every demand the British government for over the past three years. 
that Ireland is a happy member of the EU with a simple depiction to protecting its own interests in the mindset of a damaging Brexit seems to have eluded their grasp. It is easy, though, to claim that there is some kind of generalised anti-Irish statement hanging over the UK. These beliefs come not from a dislike of Irish people on the streets of London or elsewhere. Britain in general is welcoming to the Irish and has long been the home to millions of Irish immigrants. Rather, it is an institutional discomfort with Ireland's newfound status. As a member of a trading bloc, the UK decided to leave, for the first time enjoying the upper hand over its closest neighbour in the Brexit negotiations. The UK, unable to conceive of Ireland as a nation, realising its voice on an international stage, instead has found it easier to resort to a long-held stereotypes, casting Vradka and Coney as naive, as naive slaves of the EU, unwittingly preparing themselves for sacrifice at the hands of Brussels' elite later down the line. And as the Brexiteers realise the error of their own ways, not in uh, not in trying to leave the bloc, but in, unest but in unestimating precisely how difficult it would be, they have attempted to blame a nasty and vindictive EU or a foolish and naive Ireland for all the difficulties they have encountered. But ascribing mistakes made by the UK government uh, to bad faith negotiating from the EU and reducing Vradka to the image of a of of the odious uh, Tashart being uh, begging for help from the malevolent forces in Brussels is a stunning, uh, unsuitable uh, attempt uh, at a get out uh, at a get out clause designed to distract the from the UK's own errors. And as the next part, uh, the next phase gets underway, with the likelihood of striking a trade deal uh, it looking vanishingly unlikely, we are left with an unavoidable conclusion that attacks about Little Ireland's ridiculousness leaders and the naive and dishonest approach they took to negotiations comes not from a place of, uh, of a confident, uh, but the insecurity about what lies in store for Brexit Britain. So you get to a point where even other people in other countries look at this and just go, wow, you're, you're screwed. <laughs> And I, I agree with them. We are on so many levels. And I, I agree. We've seen this before. What they're trying to do is what we said all along. You may remember back when Theresa May first came in. And all the um, conservative people dropped like flies. All of them just dropped. And then it was handed off to Theresa May. And I said it back then that that was a poison chalice, that she would not be able to deliver Brexit. And what happened, turned out, I was right. It was an absolute poison chalice, so that A, she can be blamed later on down the line. And you still see this now. Theresa May being blamed for um, for, for Brexit, for, for failures in Brexit. We are seeing people blaming the EU uh, for Brexit. And you're like, guys... You've turned our closest trading ally and partner into now our closest trading enemy. They're negotiating on their behalf. That's what negotiations are. And of course they have an upper hand over us. They're a larger market. We've been over this many times. Larger markets can throw their weight around. We are nothing compared to the EU. I want to make that abundantly clear. We are nothing. So what? Some barriers get erected. Doesn't bother them. Bear in mind, over the past three years, they've done more trade deals with other countries that we want to do, who have turned around and said, when you want to do a deal with us, you ain't going to get as anywhere near as good as deal. Japan springs to mind. And so we are falling back on the old let's blame everyone but the idea of Brexit itself because I keep on saying this and I will say it until it starts to sink in. Brexit is a failing ideological project. That's all it ever was. It has no policy to back it up. It is a toothless dog. And toothless dogs can do nothing but bark. 
They can't even bite. And that is where we are headed. So, yeah, that's <laughs> nothing more else to say than that, really. Um, I definitely encourage you um, to go, again, when something happens with Brexit, the Irish Times, they tend to do have a really good view, especially from, like, the Irish point of view uh, sort of things, which is quite good to get a good perspective on in this whole mess. Because, uh, like I say, um, apart from The Guardian... Um, maybe the sun the sun has started to be started to write some more um what's going on with brexit and is starting to realize that maybe they can't proclaim how great brexit is so maybe we might start seeing from the sun but the guardian um is only really i'd say the mainstream newspaper that is actually telling the people the truth about brexit and sooner or later all these newspapers aren't going to have anyone else to blame but Boris Johnson and the people who pushed for Brexit. 